Hello, my APSC 450 class, and welcome back to environmental law, Aboriginal law, and dispute resolution. I'm recording this video again because the weather is uh, very bad outside and I couldn't make it to school, for which I apologize. So without further ado, let's talk about these issues. So this is a class where I'm trying to cover a couple of different topics to get them done now so that we can have more fun with guest lectures later on. The things we're going to talk about today are Aboriginal law, natural resources law, environmental law, and alternative dispute resolution. So the first thing I want to talk about is Aboriginal law. And what it is, is a, another source of law that is in addition to the common law and statutory law. It's something that exists sort of beside those laws and some of which has been turned into statutes. The very basics, and this is the most simplified version of it because I'm not an expert on this and I just want you to be aware of it, is that in Canada, First Nations groups are protected to be able to use the land that they have rights to in a similar way to the way that they had used it before Canada was colonized. So think of hunting and fishing. Aboriginal communities now can engage in hunting and fishing, which is the use of the land in a way that uh, non-First Nations groups cannot because their rights are enshrined in the Aboriginal rights that we have, have always been there since the start of Canada. We've just recognized them now. That includes also the use of land. So over time, Aboriginals have been able to use land in different ways, um, such as developing resources and um, generating power is another thing in BC using hydroelectric dams. So these rights extend beyond the rights that were existing when Canada was first colonized or before then. They've, uh, they've grown over the years to become more modern. But the point is that First Nations groups have rights that are based on what they used to be able to do on our land. As a result of these rights, it it causes the government, the Crown, to have duties in respect of dealing with First Nations interests. And those duties extend almost everywhere in BC. This is a map of the claims that exist for Aboriginal territories in British Columbia. Interestingly, um, more than 100% of the territory in British Columbia is claimed, if that makes sense. That's because Aboriginal groups have overlapping and competing claims. So understand that when you're working with any kind of resources or natural um, land in British Columbia, be aware that Aboriginal rights will probably play into what you're working with. Those rights will require you to consult usually with the First Nation groups who have an interest in whatever resources you're working with. That duty is placed on the Crown, but as a result of the way resources are distributed in British Columbia, the Crown gets the resources and then they are leased to individuals uh, or businesses. And those businesses must then effectively come to an agreement with the Aboriginals of that territory that they're trying to use the resources on and say, here's how we're going to get back to you. And this is usually in the form of what's called an impact benefit agreement, saying we will give you so many jobs to your First Nations community. We will give you a revenue stream in the form of a royalty. It could be all kinds of things. But essentially it says, if you want to do business in this area, which has a First Nations claim, you must come to an agreement with the First Nations that they find acceptable. So that's it. That, that's the, the main thing that I wanted you to know about uh, First Nations law. Just be aware of it if you're working in BC. 
Okay, second part to this lecture is natural resources law. So natural resources can be anything. Um, anything that comes out of the ground, anything that goes over the ground can be animals, can be minerals, can be oil and gas. That's all natural resources. These laws came about because of situations like this. This is an oil field somewhere in Texas where the oil wells, as you can see, are about 10 feet apart from one another. If you know anything about drilling or even just fluid mechanics, you know that if you have a reservoir and you have a certain pressure inside it and one well, that well is going to get all of that pressure. As soon as you add another well, that pressure is then going to be divided into two. Well, as soon as you add 100 wells, that pressure is going to be divided into 100. And at some point, there's going to be so uh, such a low pressure that none of those wells will produce. This situation arose because there were no laws at the time that said you need to work your oil reservoir according to laws that will allow people to benefit the most. This was what you could consider a tragedy of the commons, where everybody runs into the land, drills it, and tries to get oil out of it, and nobody wins. Everybody loses. So because of situations like this, the government created laws uh, regulating how to extract natural resources. So at their simplest, natural resources are owned by whoever can capture them first. Uh, in the case of, think of hunting. Say you want to hunt a fox and you're out there in a field and there's a couple other hunters there. If you can catch that fox first, you can be the owner of that fox, subject to various restrictions on hunting licenses and uh, quotas. But that's essentially what natural resources is about. Things have changed a little bit as a result of that oil field situation. And the governments have become more involved in, in regulating the extraction of resources. So now the government, the crown, owns most resources in Canada. And in order to get to those resources, you have to ask the crown to use them or to extract them. And in order to do that, you usually have to pay money to bid to have a right to explore the property. Um, but in addition, you have to do work, meaning that you need to say you're, you bought a mineral property in British Columbia, you think there's uh, copper there and you want to extract copper. In order to keep your rights to that copper potential mineral, you have to spend money or expend effort in order to drill and explore and try to extract those minerals. The government will not let you keep your rights to those minerals if you do nothing. Why? The government encourages people to use the resources and to put them to their highest and best use. So if somebody just went around buying up all the copper resources and sat on them and did nothing with them, the government would make no money from the copper, first of all, and secondly, the people wouldn't benefit because all the copper would stay in the ground and nobody could have copper wires going to their house, taking electricity. So the government says, yes, you can have the resources, but if we're going to give you a right to them, you need to work on them and you need to get them out of the ground and do things to try to get them out of the ground. So. That has all kinds of implications uh, for businesses, which is that when a business buys a mineral property, then that business needs to have a lot of money in order to start drilling and attempting to find resources and extract them. And the same thing goes for individuals. Um, it's important to note that if you buy a house, typically you don't own the mineral rights to that property. And you can't just buy the mineral rights you actually have to do work on them or pay money in place of doing work. So if you buy your house or a piece of land, a piece of farmland, um, and you didn't buy the mineral rights, you didn't get a lease to them, somebody else can come along and can say, hey, I've 
purchased these rights, I've gotten a lease from the government, I need to come onto your land and explore for them. So that person or company can come onto your land and do what's necessary, which can include things like building a road, uh, building a drilling rig, bringing on equipment. It can be a significant invasion of your uh, property in order for them to take out the resources. You may get some compensation um, as a result of them using your land, but you can't stop them. The rule is whoever owns the resources is allowed a reasonable right to enter that property and start to extract them. Um, so remember that when you're, when you're buying a house that you think might have uh, some gold underneath. So the next topic I want to talk about is environmental law. Again, just very briefly. Um, remember, what I want you to remember is this. Whenever there's any kind of emission in the air, an effluent in the water, or a waste, a solid, then there's probably some kind of environmental law that applies. So engineers come across this kind of stuff all the time. Civil engineers have building waste. They also have to deal with sewage systems and uh, with air emissions from mm, boilers and other heating equipment. Um, chemical engineers have to do with plant emissions, vapors from tanks. Um, mining engineers have to do with effluents and tailings ponds. All of those emissions and effluents are regulated. You can't do any of those things I said without following the law. And if you don't follow the law, then you could be held liable. And what's important to know about environmental offenses is that they often don't require intent. So you remember we talked about um, the punch and when you commit a battery, when you punch somebody, you have to intend it to be held liable for it. If I punch somebody because somebody else pushed my arm into them, I'm not liable for punching them because I didn't intend to do it. In environmental offenses, it doesn't matter. If you accidentally kicked over the nuclear waste barrel and it leaked into the river, you're stuck. You're liable for the emission effluent of nuclear waste into the river. If you accidentally miscalculate how much CO2 or carbon monoxide your boiler is going to produce and you're over the limit, then you're liable for the fine associated with that, if any. That's called strict liability. It means that it doesn't matter what you intended, you're just on the hook for it. So two things to remember about environmental law is first, whenever there's an emission, there's probably environmental laws that apply. And second, being ignorant of the laws is not sufficient. You can't defend yourself from that because it's strict liability. Uh, so last, last topic is dispute resolution, okay? We talked a little bit about lawsuits in the torts or negligence class and what's involved, um, and also a little bit about which courts to go to. But what I didn't say is that before you sue anybody, and before anybody sues you, they should do this as well, it's always better to try and negotiate. Why? Because more facts will come to light and there's a better chance to resolve the dispute. And it's much, much cheaper. Going to court and getting lawyers is expensive. And it's also stressful. So if you can, always try to negotiate if you're going to sue somebody or if somebody's trying to sue you. That's number one, always do that. But in addition to negotiation, there are two other types of dispute resolution that may apply. The first is mediation. Um, you can either do this voluntarily with somebody who you have a dispute with, or it may be written into a contract. If you've signed a contract and it says you have to mediate. What it is, is a decision-making process where there's a, a neutral third party who will help bring the two disputing parties together and help get the facts out from both sides and come to a reasonable resolution. It's a useful process and usually quite successful. Um, you usually pay the mediator quite a bit of money to help resolve the dispute 
But if that can avoid going to court, then it may be worth it. Um, so the key thing to remember about mediation is that once the, the person, the mediator, helps make that decision, it's not binding. The two parties don't have to agree to what the mediator says. The two parties can just say, well, you know, I don't want to do that. And they can go to court afterwards. Usually it resolves it, but not always. But the point is they're not bound by the mediator's decision. The other process, arbitration, is similar in that a neutral third party will um, help try to mediate the decision, but their decision is binding. Meaning, whatever the arbitrator says at the end of the two parties' arguments, um, that's, that's the rule. That's what goes. It's sort of like uh, a court process, but it's not as expensive, time-consuming, and it doesn't have as many procedural rules. So oftentimes you see this kind of thing in construction contracts and other international contracts so as to avoid lawsuits. So the contract will say in some clause, you agree to have this issue arbitrated in whatever territory or province of your choice. It's also a useful tool to protect yourself if you're doing international contracts. So say you're an engineer here in Canada, an individual, and you're trying to contract with other countries. You could put a clause in your contract saying, if there are any disputes in this contract, you can't sue me, but instead you have to come to Canada to have arbitration here. And that could avoid potential lawsuits. So um, the negotiation process should always be done. The mediation should be done if possible, but you don't, you don't have to do that. Uh, arbitration is another suggestion, but it's not required. They're not, they don't go in that order. You don't do mediation, then, or you don't do um, negotiation, then mediation, then arbitration. My point is just that you always want to negotiate before you do anything. Now, if all that fails, or if none of those things apply, then that's when you sue their pants off. And only at that point. Don't sue until you've at least tried one of these things, and you've at least tried negotiation. Avoid lawsuits, avoid spending a lot of money, and avoid the, the headaches that come with them. Um, speaking of headaches, I'll, I'll tell you just a quick story. This is my last slide. Um, a while ago, a couple years ago, I think it was about five years ago, I was parking my car downtown. Now, I had recently purchased a new car, um, and I was driving this new car. And I parked it in one of those pay-by-phone parking spots where you either put the number on your app or you call in and you put in your license plate and you park in the spot. Um, I forgot to update my license plate to the new car's license plate. So when I parked in the spot, I had paid, but for the wrong license plate, okay? So I do my thing, I come back, I see my car, I have a ticket. It's kind of upsetting. Um, so, you know, being the wannabe lawyer that I was at the time, I went to go look up the law. And the bylaw, the Vancouver City Parking Bylaw, says um, at that time, you, in order to use the pay-by-phone system, just needed to park in the parking spot and pay for your parking by phone. Didn't say any requirements about uh, having the license plate or even the right license plate. So fine, I, take, I, I submit my ticket, I say, let's dispute this. It goes to the adjudication process. I go stand in front of the uh, judge and I say, look, here's the situation. The bylaw says this, I was in compliance with the bylaw. You should update your bylaws. And the judge says, you're right, we, this is wrong, we should update your bylaws, um, you're off, you're, you're scot-free. I said, yes, I made it. I did it, saved myself whatever it was, 40 bucks. Okay, fast forward three years later, um, I make the same mistake. I buy a new car, go into the parking spot, put in the wrong license plate, and uh, come back, get a ticket. Ah, I'm mad again. I go and dispute the ticket. I get to the judge. <laughs> I tell the judge, look, you, got, you guys did the same thing. Y you don't have to put in your license plate number. And the judge pulls out the bylaw and it says in big bold letters, you must put in the license plate number of the car that you parked in this spot. So my point is, be careful what you wish for and choose your battles wisely. Thanks very much for watching. See you in class next time. Bye-bye.